The following program is video supplemental instruction. VSI is brought to you by the Teaching Center, UF's Learning Support Center, www.teachingcenter.ufl.edu. everyone, my name is Stephanie Morton and I'm here today to talk to you guys about the electron transport system. So first let me orient you to my diagram that I've drawn up here. Uh, this is the inner membrane space as labeled. This is the mitochondrial matrix and of course this is the, inter the inner membrane of the mitochondria. And these here are all the electron transport chain uh, proteins in here, the electron transport chain complexes, uh, labeled one, two, three, and four. So hopefully that's pretty clear. Uh, of course we have a ubiquinone coenzyme Q right in here, and we have cytochrome C up here. And then all the way over here, we have our ATP synthase uh, pointing out over here and that is not directly part of the electron transport system, so don't get confused. Uh, but it is definitely related, as you guys all know. So I guess your first question is sort of like, what is the electron transport system? Well, the electron transport system is the method that the cell uses to gather the energy in your reduced electron carriers, so NADH and FADH2, and transform that energy into a proton gradient here uh, in your mitochondria that's then going to power ATP synthesis. So let's get started talking about how the electron transport system actually works. And so we're going to go through specifically the electron flow today along with the protons being pumped through each of the complexes. Remember your proton pumps are complexes 1, 3, and 4, and then we'll just briefly go over ATP syn synthesis with ATP synthase. Uh, we're not going to go into too big of a detail there, but just sort of like what you need to know briefly. And uh, so hopefully that'll settle any questions you guys have. You guys can sort of see this a little bit better. So let's get started. All right, first thing, you need to remember sort of the golden rule for uh, your electron transport chain. And that is that electrons are always going to go from a complex or from uh, an electron carrier with a higher reducing potential to something with a lower reducing potential. So let me just write that up there. So they always move from high reducing potential to low reducing potential. And so, of course, we have to know what reducing potential means. Reducing potential, when, when something is reduced, that means it's gained electrons, right? So if something is reducing something else, that means it's giving away electrons so that the thing being reduced is gaining those electrons. So I'll just say that again. So if something is acting as a reducing agent, that means it's giving away electrons to something else so that other thing can be reduced. Of course, the reducing agent is oxidized. So if you have a high reducing potential, that means you have a great ability to give off electrons and to be oxidized yourself. And of course, when we're talking about the electron transport chain, this all makes sense, right? Because something with a high reducing potential, the, a great ability to give off electrons, is going to be able to give electrons to something that has the, a, a greater ability than this one to accept electrons, right? And that's how we're going to flow down the chain. And so, of course, going by this rule, something that's not quite as able to give away electrons is, is not going to be able to give away electrons to something that's better at giving away electrons. Kind of confusing, but the point is that something with a lower reducing potential is not going to be able to reduce something with a higher reducing potential than itself. The moral of that story is that the chain can't work backwards. So hopefully you guys are good with that. You cannot run this chain backwards and produce your reduced electron carriers. So remember, higher reducing potential to lower reducing potential. And I'm going to be drawing with blue on my diagram so you can see everything that I write, hopefully. 
So I'll just step out of the way really quick, let you guys sort of observe what's going on here. Uh, just get an overview so I'm not standing in front of everything. And I will introduce you to the complexes as we go along. So first, uh, let's, let's go from step one, obviously. So we have NADH coming in here, right? So NADH is one of our reduced electron carriers. Remember in the end that NADH can make three ATPs once you go through all of this whole process by donating its two electrons. And our other electron carrier, FADH2, can only make two ATPs. And we'll get into that. Um, so what NADH does is it's going to donate its electrons to this flavin mononucleotide right here. So again, that's FMN, flavin mononucleotide. Flavin mononucleotide has two components to it. Uh, it has an isoaloxazine ring, and it also has ribitol. And so what you have to remember is it's that isoaloxazine ring that's sort of doing the action there. Uh, those are the two components that you need to know. It's closely related to FAD. FAD is the dinucleotide. It has an adenine in there as well. Uh, whereas FMN just has the isoloxazine ring and ribitol. So, but what you need to know, NADH gives its electrons to FMN, and of course, what we're left up with is NAD+, plus, right, which just sort of floats away. Um, FMN is actually part of complex one here, so it gets two electrons, right? So I'll, I'll write those in here. So two electrons, and these two electrons are, actually there's another proton included in here, uh, but these, these two electrons are what we're going to be following through this chain today. So just keep that in mind, we're talking about NADH being oxidized, right, this FMN being reduced and then all the other carriers being reduced as we go down the chain, and with every NADH you use, you get two electrons. So that's what we're working with, two electrons, one NADH. Okay. So these two electrons go on to FMN, right? And they reduce FMN. Remember FMN with the isooloxacine ring and the ribitol. All right, so now they're gonna sort of travel through complex one. And complex one also has an iron sulfur center. As you can guess, iron sulfur centers are things made up of iron and sulfur. So, um, not too much more you need to know about those. They are electron carriers. Iron gets reduced from Fe3 plus to Fe2 plus in these centers. Uh, a lot of times you will be working with iron when you're talking about metals and these things. You'll see iron again in your cytochromes as well. All right, so now remember our two electrons are traveling through the complex. Now they're at the iron sulfur center. So then we're going to give our electrons, and it's a little difficult to see, so I'll actually draw another one here, to something called coenzyme Q, or ubiquinone. Okay, and this is something that has a quinone ring and a very, very long isoprenoid tail. So CoQ is found in the inner membrane, and you would expect something to be found in the inner membrane to be, to be hydrophobic, right? Because you're in a lipid environment, right? Nothing that's, that's gonna be water loving, if you will, is gonna be in here. Anything that's water loving would be out here. So anything that's hydrophilic would be out here. CoQ is hydrophobic. And the reason for that is it's hydrophobic, very long 10 isoprene unit tail. And you guys all remember what isoprenes are. And uh, so again, this quinone ring now is where you have the electrons being transferred to. CoQ can accept two electrons, and so it accepts these two electrons. I'm gonna just remind you here that that's what we're following. These two electrons still going to CoQ now. CoQ is different from the complexes in that it is actually mobile in the inner membrane. So it can travel through the inner membrane and do what I'm about to tell you, which is go straight over here and reduce, well, I guess I should go. Uh, it's going to reduce cytochrome B 
on complex three. And if you'll notice, we skipped complex two, and I'll come back to that in about two seconds. So, but the important thing right now is that coenzyme Q, or ubiquinone, is going to travel through the membrane, not through complex two, but through the membrane. So think going around complex two, right, in the membrane and reduce cytochrome B. So again, we're passing off those two electrons to cytochrome B. Okay, so we'll stop there for about two seconds and we'll talk about complex two really quick. And uh, we'll get into proton pumping a little bit later when we have all the complexes. So complex two here is a little bit different. This is where you get the introduction of FADH into the chain. Uh, when uh, this is, so this is succinate dehydrogenase. This is NADH dehydrogenase, right? Obviously, because it's dehydrogenasing NADH. This uh, does its dehydrogenation on, on succinate. And so what's going to happen when succinate comes up onto succinate dehydrogenase, which you'll remember is the only enzyme of the TCA cycle that's found in the mitochondrial inner membrane, all the rest are in the matrix, of course. This is going to come up, and it's going to reduce FAD into FADH2, right? So now, this just gave two electrons here, along with the proton, into FADH2. And um, so now, FADH2, again, we're still following two electrons, right? Every time there's a transfer of two electrons. In NADH, the electrons are given in the form of a hydride, and in FADH2, uh, you actually get the two protons transferred. So in any case, these two electrons are, just as in complex one, going to be transferred to an a iron sulfur center, and they're going to be transferred to ubiquinone, right? Because remember, ubiquinone is sort of swimming around inside the lipid bilayer of the inner membrane, and it can float to complex one and complex two. And if you'll recall from class, you remember another enzyme is actually sort of like up here that I didn't draw just to simplify things, and that's glycerol 3-phosphate dehydrogenase. Remember, that enzyme is involved in the shuttle uh, for getting NADH into the mitochondrial matrix and uh, it's located on the membrane and it doesn't shuttle anything across, it just transfers electrons directly to CoQ. So if that's confusing, definitely look at your notes. Uh, your book, the Leninger book, has it on page, let me find that, where did it go? Ah, there it is, on page 713, and that is in the fifth edition of the Leninger text. So, we've transferred our two electrons here in, in complex two from succinate to FADH2 to iron sulfur complex, and now the two electrons are on CoQ, and of course, just as in complex one, CoQ is going to transfer those electrons, those two electrons, to cytochrome B. So now we're caught up with both complexes. So hopefully this is all making sense to you guys so far. Okay. So we start at cytochrome B here. This is complex three right here. Uh, and the two electrons are transferred to an iron sulfur center, which we've seen before. And then they're transferred to cytochrome C1. And I think now that I'm talking about cytochromes, I should probably maybe introduce you guys into a little bit of what a cytochrome is. So you guys all remember heme, heme groups from things like hemoglobin. Uh, stuff like that. So cytochromes have heme groups in them with, of course, an iron at the center. And that iron functions to accept the electrons and transfer them, of course. So, all right. So now we're at cytochrome C1. Okay. And uh, remember that the things I've drawn here aren't exactly where they're located on the enzymes. If you want the exact structure as structure biologists have determined it, that's all in your book. I'm not that complex <laughs> or skilled at drawing. So this is just sort of a simplified representation. They are, of course, on the right complexes. Just, you know, cytochrome B isn't necessarily right there. <laughs> so, but anyways, that's all right. So cytochrome C1 is going to transfer its electrons, remember we're talking about two electrons, to cytochrome C. 
Cytochrome C is another sort of unique thing, much like um, coenzyme Q, in that cytochrome C is mobile, and that makes it special. Cytochrome C functions to transfer electrons from complex 3 to complex 4. And to do that, it moves along the inner membrane space side of the mitochondrial um, uh, inner membrane, and it transfers electrons. So uh, it, it just kind of moves back and forth, right? I've drawn it here kind of as it would be moving. So it's definitely not permanently stationed right here. It's a mobile electron carrier that goes alongside the um, uh, inner membrane space side of the inner membrane. All right, so now these two electrons are going to sort of follow this path, the cytochrome C, and they're going to be transferred down to actually a copper, but um, really where they wind up is cytochrome A, and that's what you need to know. Now we're in complex four. This is called cytochrome C oxidase, of course, because it oxidizes cytochrome C1, and it gets reduced from that reaction. So now we have our two electrons on cytochrome A, then they go down to cytochrome A3, and then cytochrome A3 is going to finally, oops, it is going to finally reduce oxygen down here. And remember, we're only talking about two electrons from NADH, and those two electrons can only reduce one oxygen atom, okay? Here we have a diatomic oxygen that requires four electrons, all right? So really, what we're reducing is one half of this oxygen right here, okay? And that is, of course, going to make water which can then just sort of flow off. The Teaching Center, UF's Learning Support Center, www.teachingcenter.ufl.edu.